Any, uh, believe, quiz on chapter two and three today? So any question on, we'll just start with chapter two. I do have a question on the homework set. The yes. Master set. Uh, uh, master set, you said? Uh, any questions from the chapter two home textbook problems? I, I, I want to get back to it, but I okay. Um, I have a question for number thirteen. Five zero. Yes. Um, it's the last time. Okay. B. Uh, the answer says that. The car car A will increase the distance. Like it will like the distance between the cars will increase. That's what the answer says. But I don't really get that because I feel like car A is decreasing in velocity. So shouldn't the distance between A and B decrease? All right. So I assume you're talking about part B. Yes. All right. So in part B. It talks about from time T1 to T2. Mm -hmm. So, sorry. So car A is, this is a velocity versus time graph. And that's car A and then car B is steady right there. And time, let's see, T3 is at the intersection of the two. So that's T3 and then T2. One. So in part B, when you're going from time two, time T1 to time T2, think about the velocity here. In this region right here, the velocity of A is larger than the velocity of B the entire time. Mm -hmm. Assuming it's a one-dimensional problem, and they're going in the same direction. Since A is traveling faster than B the entire time, it's it's got to be increasing the lead. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. Now the rate at which that lead is increasing starts to drop off, but the, it's still increasing. Oh. B doesn't start to catch up till after T three. But since um, the increase in the lead decreases, shouldn't the distance? Uh, it would be so for example it starts out so A's lead over B so it starts out at let's just say 10 meters and then 15 meters then 19 meters then if I can do math here, 22 meters. So A is still getting a, getting a greater lead over B. It's still getting farther, pulling farther away, except the difference is increased by five, then you increase by four, then you increase by three. So that's, that's sort of what's happening here as A is slowing down, but still traveling faster than B. Thank you. Yep. Any other questions from the textbook problems from chapter two? All right, Kyle, you had a master set question? Yes. It was number three about the heroin crime. The oaken bucket? Okay. I looked up how to do it, but what? They showed me to do a lot. It's completely different than what we learned in class. And I was like, I tried to do it the way we're doing it in class, and I lost. I assume you left a not nasty comment on whatever the online site is saying that they were fools. <laughs> <laughs> well, it was it was just a different way of doing it. It was like using a, some law of motion. Well, all right. So in this case right here, the first one is you're throwing the ball from a particular height. <laughs> and then you're catching it at a particular height. So that's just straight, I think it's a horizontal projection if I recall correctly. 
And so it's a projectile motion problem. I assume was the issue with that, or um, where was, which one was your issue? I get I understand that you're throwing it across the right, but that don't you? So I guess my understanding of the right is it spins all the way around, and you by the time you get you get over to the other side, you catch the dragon. Right. Okay. And so therefore, you know. Uh, because I tell how fast it spins. I forget the information that I explicitly give. Or do you figure out how fast it has to spin? You can figure out. All right. Do you have the, can I see a copy of the problem? Thank you. What's your number it is? Number three. All right. So, uh, let's see. You are given, you know, this is, you know the horizontal displacement. 1.6 meters, and then mass of the ball is irrelevant to this problem. Okay, and you know the vertical is going to drop 0.7 meters because it goes from 1.7 meters to 1 meter. Since the ball is being thrown horizontally, you can find the time based upon that right there. Just if you drop a ball, how long does it take to drop 0.7 meters? And so once you know time and you know the horizontal distance, you can find the initial speed because it's all horizontal. Just like part A of the projectile motion lab without the propagation of error. Oh, uh, and, and in case it's not clear, I know you're going to be disappointed. There's no propagation of error on the first test. Unless there's a big ground swell. I, I, I will do it if you want me to. There's the people who are shaking their heads no are thinking of me. They said, you know, we don't want you to worry about it. <laughs> okay. So if you know the initial speed here, it's being that's the final velocity in some at some angle here with two components. The horizontal component will be the same as it started. The vertical component, it's I drop a ball, how fast is it going after it falls 0.7 meters? Uh, angular speed. Well, we assume this thing's going to spin around at a constant speed. I know that speed is distance over time. Angular speed is angle over time. And because we're cool, we're going to use radians here for the angle. So you're basically going all the way to the other side of a circle. So the angle would be Hi. yes. And you know time because you know how much time it takes to get across. Linear speed. There's a relationship there. V is equal to omega r which I'm pretty sure we derived in class. So you know omega now, you know r, because I gave you the diameter, so you can find v. And the last little bit, which really throws most people, is if you picture an overhead view, you want the ball to go in that direction. But you, if we assume that from this point of view it's traveling counterclockwise, <clears throat> you are traveling in this direction at some speed here, which you find in part E. So the question is how do you throw it so that the net velocity is in that direction? You don't want to throw it so you catch it over here. You want to throw it so you catch it over here. And so well, you've got that component straight across, which you found out in part B, and you just need to offset that speed right there, so you have to throw it back. And so that's the angle right there that I'm asking you to find for part F. I sort of did a scattershot approach there to, to go over the problem. I don't know if there's something more specific you would like me to address. No, I completely understand that now. Okay. 
just the horizontal and like I was thinking of it instead and that's what threw me off like like it, the height change and everything I wouldn't even think of it that way but, yeah. yeah and by the way the first attempt to write it in a disappointment you know, it was Carolyn's. You wait in line for an hour to get for a one minute ride. And it's finally the next turn I was gonna get on it. Somebody threw up, they closed it down. Thank you for going over that. Yeah. Uh, I actually have a quick question on this. On uh, number four, is the acceleration um, centrifugal or centripetal? It won't be centrifugal. Okay, so it would be like a negative number. Uh, the negative sign comes in as a directional thing. So, sorry, Kyle. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. uh, so you'll need to indicate direction, and so the minus sign most likely will come in there. Okay. Um, can I? For number one, um, for the angle of release with respect to horizontal, which one is it? Is it the zero point? Is this the David and Goliath? Yes. Okay. All right, so you're swinging around. So basically center circle right there. Goliath is over here, not the scale. And so angle of release, so basically the thing's gonna do something like that. And I think I define angle of release as from the horizontal. Mm -hmm. So that's the angle of release. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm pretty sure, and unless I defined it differently there. But angle of release traditionally is from the horizontal. Mm -hmm. Is that sufficient? You're, you're looking at it precious, like there, there's more. Well, because um, when I search it online as well, so you have the radius, yeah, and then you have the 0 0.6 across, yeah. Uh, 0 0.6, okay. And then, so and I tell you, I tell you the radius, right? Yeah, zero point okay. eight. So I was confused whether um, it's between the two of them, which is the angle of release. Oh, this angle right yeah, here. Yeah, or another angle. That one right there. Yeah. It would be so. You would use the trig to figure out that angle right there, which I'll just call phi, and that's the right angle there. So the angle of release is the other one. Yeah. Yes. Okay. You know, think of it as a bonus type problem where you, you know you walk into it expecting to do a physics problem and suddenly you have to what a geometry you do. Good times. You can think about the angle of elevation. Do you think of that as the angle of elevation? Uh, I'm not familiar with that expression itself, but angle of elevation is uh, probably. Because you said it's a horizontal problem. So the angle of the elevation. Yeah. Is angle of elevation a, a phrase in some particular discipline or? Yeah. yeah. Okay. It's great. It was in one of your problems. Oh. Your problems. Yeah, it must be right. <laughs> My engineering background tells me that I don't have to remember anything. I just have to know what to look it up. It would be nice to remember more stuff though. Except that Kinnage. It was my first year here. This guy was sagging, had his pants down halfway down his butt. He was not wearing underwear. <laughs> I cannot erase that memory.
he was kicked out of class, told the good deal with it. So he comes back, he went to the bathroom, grabbed some paper towels, and had paper towels in his crack. I'm hoping he's now a productive member of society. All right, any questions on chapter three? The textbook. Do this thing. Uh, since it is two chapters uh, worth of quizzes, uh, I, I, I hope it doesn't take 40 minutes to do it, but at 40 minutes, if anyone's still working on it, you're done. Is there another question? How is this? So, when are we doing the new second online? Thursday. In two days. Okay. Yeah, I, I need to. Uh, no, the test is next week. How long will the test be? Uh, it's what we're doing that class. So, uh, let me. Uh, Max has a question first, and then I'm sorry. then ask about the test. Um, for the second draft, it says um, end of four courses, but for this week's Thursday, is the result like. So in the resultant in problem part 11 is just the sum of the first three. Yeah. The resultant in number 12 is the sum of all four. So that should be like theoretically. Yes. Okay. And don't forget it's a vector so there's a direction involved. Oh, yeah. Any other questions? Oh, the test. How long is it? I, I, I am happy to say that four and a half hours is now an aberration for one of my tests. It used to be, I would call it, at four and a half hours, I, I was too tired. It was 10.30 at night. And the interesting thing about 251 students is that 251 student has no problem staring at the same problem for a half hour not writing anything down. <laughs> One ten students look at it and go, I don't know how to do this and move on. So they're pretty quick. Uh, but uh, Ms. Sassen actually probably gave me the best advice I've ever gotten in writing a test, and that is one fewer. So whatever I think is the right amount, take a problem off. <clears throat> For online, I don't do that. Online, they get longer ones. Which chapters have the most content? Or will, will show the most? The one that it happens to be when I write it. So how I write my tests is, since I have 251 tests going back to, I guess, 2011, when I officially started teaching 251, I go to the page where I've got all of those tests, I close my eyes, I run the cursor up and down, and then I click. And that, usually after a couple of tries, I get the one where there's actually something there. Uh, then I take that as my starting point. So I now I bring up that test, I highlight the whole thing in yellow, just so I know what the old original test is, and then go through it. And they go, wow, I really like that kind of problem, so why don't I do one like that? Wow, that was a really horrible problem, so I'm just taking that one out. And I was watching something on TV yesterday, and wow, that inspired me for a problem. So that's how I make my tests. And then if I'm listening to sage advice, once I've written it, I will move to a problem. And then if I'm really doing it right, I do the test to proof it, as opposed to proofing it on the go when some student comes up during the middle of the test and says, is this problem possible? On my first year here was the worst case. It was a quiz, and I gave them a problem that was not solvable. And so 
and half the students had already taken it and left by the time so this brought to my attention. And so I had a redo of the, that quiz and the redo also was not solvable. I, ha I haven't been that bad since, so it's been almost a decade. Other questions? All right. Forces. So I guess this officially is chapter five. This is the first material for the second test or test one to be. Why don't we start out with, we haven't done the rope in the hallway yet, did we? No. no. Start out with rope in the hallway. And you had to write that or you had to prove it like with an equation? You have to uh, find the time for that. Yeah, he looked like he was asking for the value. Yeah. I don't know. You don't have to prove it. You just have to write it. Because like you already proved it from the
it to the end. You have to explain it. It's so little it. twist that you can not have to explain it. Yeah, you don't have to twist it. You don't have to actually. I was trying to find it. Yeah, I feel like that one is all right. But I haven't quite figured that out. Yeah, if you All right, so, other than the explanation that Lawson is much stronger than he looks, or claims. Uh, wait a minute. What? <laughs> How is he able to overpower them? Matter of fact, he was almost had them off their feet. Because uh, the force that he was applying was in the center. So if you think of it as a bridge, the more supported wings you have, the more stable the bridge is. So the more wait, the more supportive length there is. Yeah. So like if the if they were real close together, he couldn't build them. The farther. But it, if there's a bigger span between like right. the supports right. of a bridge. So why does a bigger span make it easier for Lawson? In the case of a bridge, you, the weight of the bridge is significant. In this case, the weight of the rope is not significant. Hmm. Is this force the center escaping? Oh, it's the force is escaping? From the center? Uh, no. Matter of fact, the force all along the rope is pretty, is relatively constant. The force, they, they were saved, uh, certain is opposite in the same line, and he's just going 90 degrees uh, off it. All right. Most of the effort that they were spending was fighting against whom? Yeah. And so, obviously, direction matters, force is a vector. But if we think about that, as he's pushing down, we have, we start out with all this force acting in these directions at the center, and there's nothing to oppose that. When it gets to later on, so now when it's tipped, dipped like that, and, and Lawson, as you pulled it down, did you find it harder as you went down, easier, or about the same? Maybe slightly harder, but probably mostly the same. Uh, let's go with the slightly harder. Okay. <laughs> Depends on how long the rope is. If the long is, if the rope is long enough, then you probably wouldn't notice it. And at this point, the rope is long enough. I've done it with shorter ropes, and it's a lot harder. Uh, so I agree with you. The, the shorter the distance between them would have made it a lot harder. But the reason why is how much of this force is actually opposing Austin? Well, pardon? Well, I said not. Well, at, at that point, yes, but at this point, it's not completely zero. Because whatever the component um, yeah. vector is right there. So it's obviously not the scale here. Yeah. So it's this part right here, but most of it, because this angle is so incredibly small, most of their force is still fighting each other. So a whole lot of physics is dealing with, deal, first off, you analyze what are the forces involved in a problem, and then what is the total force acting on an object? And that is the, the crux, well, ultimately, almost all of physics. Now, at some point, they disguise it, and they talk about energy, they talk about momentum, and angular momentum, and other things, but at the crux of it, there is force. So if I have some sort of ring here, and I have forces acting in three directions. If the ring is an equilibrium, and I feel pretty sure we've done this enough, what does equilibrium mean? What are the three conditions? Or what is a condition and the three manifestations of that? Velocity is zero. Say it again. Velocity is zero. No. That I'll agree with. Velocity is all equal. What velocities? 
Is it velocity is plural? Yeah. Uh, I'm talking about just the ring itself. Not necessarily. Yeah, All right. There is something to do with velocity, but it's not velocity being zero. The change in velocity. Yeah. yeah. We can expand on that. If the velocity is indeed zero, that is known as static equilibrium. If it is not zero, dynamic equilibrium. Now it makes sense that they both be in equilibrium because what does it mean for velocity to be zero? Tell me something that is not moving. The, the table or the, the, lap, the laptop's not moving. Is the laptop moving? Anyone want to make a claim that the laptop is moving? Yeah. Once, yeah. once you take a reference, uh, I don't know if you say it in it's a reference point. Because let's say here, in this moment, we can say that thing is not moving. But the air, Earth is rotating, it is moving. And the Earth is translated around the sun, then it's moving, and the galaxy, and so on. So and the question is then, is there an absolute reference frame? Is there some observational point of view that you could look at something and go, yes, that's not moving. The answer to that is no, there is no such reference. There is no absolute reference. So whether something is moving or not depends upon the observer. And if it depends upon the observer, equilibrium should not depend, should be independent of the observer. So whether something's moving or not, since that's based upon the observer, we still have two types of equilibrium here. Well, at least two names for equilibrium. So, obviously, equilibrium for chapters two through four. These are the two big ones right there. And now we're getting into this one. <laughs> now, it is not written here. It is supposed to be understood that when I write the force is equal to zero, this is a reference to the total force. I am not claiming that there are no forces acting. All I'm doing is claiming that the total, if we add up all the forces, we get zero. So if this ring is in equilibrium, and it doesn't matter if it's static or dynamic, I should be able to add these three forces together and get zero. So, it comes down to a vector addition, which is what we did in the first week. So if that is five newtons, and oh, that looks like about 40 degrees, and I think that's seven newtons, and 150 degrees, and this is looking like about 280 degrees, and about, let's say, four newtons, 280 degrees. I have no idea if this, how close this will be to zero. Okay, I have some idea, but it's probably not going to work out exactly. I can add these three forces, and I've got several ways of doing it. So let's just run through one of them. Algebra tree. I have three vectors in polar form. Basically, the math problem is I have, well, all the units are the same there. So 5, 40 degrees, plus 7, 150 degrees plus four, 280 degrees. That's the math problem. Let's set up a coordinate system that makes sense. Since these angles are based upon the horizontal and vertical, well, actually, that's zero degrees this way. Let's set up a coordinate system that way. 
Yeah, J hat. It's a dimensional problem, so we need to employ something other than just plus, plus or minus. So what is the horizontal component? Five. Five. So, Forty degrees. So I have five cosine 40 degrees I hat. Thus, the vertical? Five times 40. Uh, please make sure that when you're doing this on your calculator that you are in degrees. We will be dealing with degrees until later on in the semester, which is when we will suddenly switch over to radians, but we'll be dealing with degrees until then. That's the first one. The next one, go through the same process. Seven cosine 150 degrees plus seven sine of I hat plus seven sine 150 degrees J hat plus, and then the last one, four cosine 280 degrees I hat plus four sine 280 degrees J hat. Now you should have some idea whether you'll get a positive or negative number. Isn't that supposed to be negative? Seven cosine 150. No. Why not? Why should this not be negative here? The the degree? Or what, what, what should what, what what are you saying should or shouldn't be negative? I think you are suggesting that I should have a minus sign right here. Cosine of four times. If you do it by the reference angle, then yes, you do need to think through it and go, oh, that's going to the left, that'll be negative. But if you use the entire angle, the negative sign's gonna come out of the math. So, and so, given a coordinate system, this should be both be positives, this should be a negative and a positive, and this will be a positive and a negative. So if it doesn't come out that way, then Check your units. Although there was one test where I picked the angle that it didn't matter if you were radians or degrees, you get the same answer. All right. So let's just go through it since we're here. Five cosine like 40 degrees. Three point eight three. Three point eight three. Three point eight three. Three point eight three. Okay. I hat plus three point seven three. I would expect angles under forty five degrees, reference angles under forty five degrees, that the horizontal component is bigger than the vertical component, so that makes sense. They're about the same because we're close to forty five degrees. Uh, let's see, the second one is going to be plus 3.5 J hat. Negative 6.06. That's the first one. The second one. And that will be small. 0 0.69. Negative 3.94. Um, I'm not getting the same answer for 5 sine 40. I'm getting 3.2 something. 3.21. 3.21. Is that a 3.21 over there? Yeah. Oh. It's 3.21 then? 3.21. Like you would say. Right. Any other corrections? Just for that, I'm going to make a mistake on the test. Okay. 
what we all have in common. So now we add up the I parts and the J parts. Negative one point five four and two point seven seven. Nowhere close to equilibrium. Questions to hear. I sort of skimmed over this. this. Some of this should have been somewhat reviewed just with a physics context. But again, I, I know I, I've had students in the past with really weak trade backgrounds, so I, this is a chance to ask questions. All right, so this is not an equilibrium, so we need to do something. Let's suppose I add a fourth force in there. <clears throat> what is the fourth force that I would add and actually to put this into equilibrium? Positive 1.54 I hat. Negative 2.77. Like that? Oh, let's nitpick. What's wrong? Can I the magnitude? Uh, no, not unless if there's a mistake. Um. Not unless there's a mistake down there. We're good on that. Yes. Now what's wrong with it? Convert it to a different form. Pardon? Convert it to a different form. Oh, no, not an issue with that. Issue with the units. Add parentheses and then multiply by both. Newton's goes with both of these things. So, all right, there we go. Everyone's happy. I'm grading this, I'm thinking, all right. They got the units now. Got direction, everything's good. Not the, I can't believe this person showed such brilliant work and have taken off 30% because they forgot the units. If I plotted the sum of the first three vectors and I plot in the fourth one, how would they look? If I drew the tail to tail. Uh, not the way I hear you saying it. I was, I was just trying to see yes, from your hand gestures what you would then. So it's going to be enclosed, like everyone, everything's going to be connected because the resulting term is zero. Oh, that's if I added the fourth force yeah. in there. The question, the question was, oh, if okay. I added the sum of the first, if I plotted the sum of the first three and the fourth one, how would they look? And how would they plot? What do you mean? But if I drew it down, come up, we got a coordinate system here, I hat, K hat, and I just draw my two vectors. You draw this vector and that vector? Yes. Symmetrically. They're going to be opposite? More specifically. There should be some symmetry there, reflection about the origin. But the sum of the first three vectors is I'm going to the left. 1.54 newtons and down, so that's 1.54 newtons, and down 2.77 newtons. So with adding the factors, it's, it's always from where you start to where you end. Yeah. 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 That is correct. <laughs> I still get to make a mistake on the test. <laughs> I 
So that is the resultant. This is the sum of the first three vectors. And then the fourth vector, bring it into equilibrium, should be, and we can do the incredibly spectacular, stunning visual effects that you are so used to seeing here. And this is 1.54 newtons to the right and 2.77 newtons down. And so that's the resultant of F4. And I believe we've answered some of the questions that are actually on the lab. So when you are actually doing the lab, in part A, you've got the three forces that you're adding together. Now, it should come out much closer to zero because <laughs> we, you know, it's not some half-ass drawing on the board. And I asked you to break it down into X and Y components. I probably shouldn't use X and Y, but I had J hat or horizontal, vertical. Uh, I had a weak moment. Um, so horizontal and vertical components, you add them up, and you should get something close to zero. The fourth one, you're going to, oh, and then after you've done it analytically, one of the questions says to ask you to do it graphically, where you're going through and you have a ruler and you have a protractor or you're using software that knows how to do it properly. You take some point, and so I would draw, you pick one of them, doesn't matter which one with which you start, and you carefully come up with some scale. And don't just slap it onto a piece of paper. I'm just thinking the best group I ever had that could do this were the people, it was the CPCC, they were studying to be dress, dressmen. That was some precision work. So if any of you are potential draftsmen or actually do draft, drafting work, and I'm not talking magic to gathering drafting, <laughs> then I have one person who understands it. Uh, here's a chance for you to show off. And so you draw the first one, you now have a point. You draw the second one using the same scale. You draw the third one. And then the resultant, please don't forget to draw the resultant in there. It's from where you started to where you ended. That's the resultant. And I go through that in the videos. It's the fourth video that I have attached there where I go through and actually with very precise measuring do that. I have a question about that from the lab. Yes. I um, do the first one and the resultant was outside of the resultant was outside the triangle, as in? Like, um, inside of the triangle stuck out. And it, I, I have two interpretations for what you just said. Are you talking about something like this, where it's supposed to be a triangle, but it's not? Or are you talking about the fact no, that it makes it's... a complete triangle, but then two lines of the triangle stick out farther. Can you come up and draw that? I, I'm not, I'm no longer picturing it. Oh, okay. So something like that happens just, it's based on the order in which you add them. I tend to try to draw them so that it actually comes back and completes. Uh, if you had drawn this one last, so if you've done that, and then that, and then that one, they wouldn't have overlapped. It, and it doesn't matter, it, there's no special thing about whether they overlap or not, it's just the, visually I find that more appealing than when they cross over, but that's just, that's me. So, yeah. If, so in your case, you had it down like that. So the resultant, uh, so you started here and went like that, that, and 
that. So the result of the look like that. If the arrows are in the other direction, then it, the, arrow, the, the result has to be the other way. Okay. Is there any problem in just doing the X and Y and C? I mean, the, each of the, in this case, it's a plane, a, a plane, no? The X and Y of each one and adding the whole thing. Oh, it's, oh. It's so very, very similar to what you did that. I mean, it's the case. Uh, as in when you draw it? Because one of the part, one of the things I asked you to draw it. So draw it based on this, mm -hmm. as opposed to, that's fine, just I, I'm still gonna take a protractor down there and make sure that your angle is right. And it should, I mean, if, if this was done properly and I drew that out, I should get 40 degrees. I don't have a protractor, I just put it, plug it in the in the computer, you suggested that, and the numbers are almost identical. Of, the, of, yeah, there what, are, of what I calculated in the calculator. There are multiple ways, just recognize that when I, Great, the, the part where I'm asking you to draw it graphically, that whether you use a computer or whether you're doing it by hand, uh, showing off your just incredible, beautiful draftsman work. Draftsman <laughs> I, I, work. I just put it in the computer, the numbers are there, and took a photo, no, a PDF. Uh, I'm still gonna take a protractor to make sure the angle's right. Mm -hmm. And don't forget, put the heads on the vectors. Don't just draw lines. Other questions at the moment? All right, I'm hoping that's enough to get you going on the lab. Because now we need to talk about what a force actually is. All right, so what is a force? Mass times acceleration. Uh, that's what the total force equals, but that's not actually what a force is. Push or pull exerted on an object? True, yeah. Um, is it possible to have a push or pull not on an object? We'll let the philosophers deal with that. The official definition that I've seen is it's an influence that might cause acceleration, which to me is probably one of the vaguest, most vague definitions you can really come up with. It really doesn't say much. So I prefer the one that Precious just gave, or at least the first part, push or pull. I think on an object is implied, but uh, no harm in throwing that in. And apparently, picking up the speed and black marker. Yeah, we're very good with the good ones. Now, there are a certain set of forces that we deal with on a regular basis here. We'll add a couple as we go. Uh, the basic approach to doing physics or, or teaching physics is you start out with the nice ideal cases and you get rid of all the pesky stuff and then over time you start bringing in a little bit more reality as you go. So we're going to start out with just some basic things and then over time we'll bring in more reality as well as if you take more advanced, again in engineering classes you'll bring in even more reality and eventually you'll be designing bridges or planes or whatever you're doing. Buildings. Roads. I think it pretty much covers it. Like biomedical engineering, drilling really engineering. Oh, any biomedical engineers in here? From perspective, mm -hmm. got one. Yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> I knew it say that. Yeah, one of the one of the brilliant people I knew at Duke was a biomedical engineer. All right, <laughs> so I came up with a checklist here 
FCOM. Now, if you watch the video in which I have uh, force diagrams and sing, 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 that's the music in the background. I, I have, instead of F-Tong, I have F-Town. And uh, so I'll talk about the difference between the two. Or the fact there's no difference, just a letter. F stands for friction. T for tension. O for other. Now I needed a vowel, uh, but other does have a specific meaning here. N for normal and G for gravitational. When I do F town with a W there, W is for weight, which is a gravitational force. Uh, for whatever reason, for 110, I start, I give them weight and then later make it more general. And for 251 and 151, I start with gravitational and then just talk about the specific case of weight. So there are two types of gravitational. The symbol that I use, For friction, I use what I call the Baroque F. Or a lowercase f with a little bit of flair. For tension, I use F with a subscript of T. I used to use capital T, but there is a point later on in the semester where we do need tension and period in the same equation. Period is a time where we're using T, capital T for period. And so instead of using capital T for tension now, and then when we get to that point going, all right, we're now gonna change it. We're gonna start with FT to start with. I missed the capital T days, but it, it is, saves us time later on. Uh, other, the symbol is problem specific. The symbol I use for normal force is a capital Y because my high school physics textbook used the capital Y, and it's stuck. The other advantage of it is that we don't use capital Y for anything else. Potentially Young's modulus, but we don't really cover that uh, in this course. And gravitational depends upon, if we're talking about weight, a lowercase w for weight, or the more generalized F with a subscript G for the gravitational, generalized gravitational force. Let's see if I can write it so that someone can actually read it. Generalized gravitational force. But we'll be using weight until chapter seven. So. Questions to hear? <clears throat> did I get this thing going again? I did. All right. When to use it? Uh, actually, let's do it this way. Requirements. Friction is required, or a requirement for friction is there needs to be contact and desired relative motion. An example of what I mean by desired relative motion. I take a small little slinky here and I put it on top of the lab quest. As I move to the right, or to your right, the slinky is moving along with it. If this box were frictionless, if I move to the to your right, what would this what would this do if this were frictionless on top? Slide. Which way would it slide? Relative to the box, it would slide that way. Relative to the ground, which way would it slide? You know, it wouldn't slide anywhere, it would eventually fall, which I think is what you were going for, what you were gesturing earlier. 
So if this were frictionless, I'd move the box off to my left, and that would, this would move, this would actually stay where it is relative to the ground, but relative to the box, it is moving that way. And that's what I mean by desired relative motion. Relative to what it is touching, does it want to move? If it were frictionless, would it move? Relative to what it is touching. So that's the desired relative motion. Tension requires a taut rope, chain, string, Basically, tension is a pulling force. Other, the requirement for other is a source which is unknown or irrelevant. E and T or A and T? Mm -hmm. A. A, B, E? No. It does look wrong. That's, yeah, yeah. that's not right. <laughs> that's a, yeah. I thought it was being a uh, right? like, but never mind. <laughs> I was right. All right, you are. <laughs> not a hallucination. Damn, guys, it's not my native language. <laughs> yeah, what's wrong with the rest of you? Actually, I'm curious about that. For how many of you is English your native language? What's wrong with you? <laughs> I don't think of it as a misspelling, but creative spelling. Just exercising my creativity. All right. Normal force, requirement, contact. Where tension pulls, normal force pushes. It's normal force that's keeping me from falling through the floor. For generalized gravitational force, you just need two masses. For weight, you need a small mass with small quotation marks near a huge mass. I have weight because I'm near the planet Earth. There's a gravitational force between me and the, and the laptop on Precious' desk, but it is not weight. The Earth and Sun are not close enough to each other to be calling it weight, but there is still a gravitational pull between the Earth and Sun. Fortunately, Questions to hear. Do they feel magnetic somewhere there? There are uh, the other forces that we'll deal with this semester. Buoyant force will show up, and an ideal elastic force will show up. Electromagnetic, the electric force, magnetic forces, or electromagnetic in general, would be the next semester force. Yeah. And I avoid air resistance. Yeah. But by the end, we can. In reality, all those no normal and, and friction, I suppose, reduced to electromagnetic in, in. Yeah, the in terms of the basic forces, uh, gravitational is separate, yeah, separate, but normal tension and friction would all be electromagnetic forces. But then, you know. The reference when I made earlier about electromagnetic forces, I was being uh, less generalized the electric force specifically, the force between charges, magnetic force, 
uh, the force between magnets. But electromagnetic force, in reality, as you know, is a huge, really broad category. Other questions at the moment? All right, when we start dealing with forces, one important thing to realize, and there's not a lot of times in physics where there's an always, but forces, always come in pairs. For those of you who want to pursue theoretical physics, you will potentially come across an exception, but I'm still gonna use the word always. So that means that for any force that I'm dealing with, there are two of them. And so one of the questions is the direction of the forces of direction of, I want to say, each force in the pair. Since they come in pairs, that means I have two forces. How do they react to each other? In the case of friction, they are anti-parallel. Side by side when we draw them in the diagrams, but that's the relationship with them. Tension will always be pointed. The pair of tension forces will always be pointed towards each other. The other force, the source when the uh, force when the source is unknown or irrelevant. There is a second part of that, but we generally don't care about it because either we don't know where it goes because the source is unknown, or we don't care. And this is from a physics point of view. This is not your own personal philosophy about physics. When I draw my pair of normal forces, they are always opposing each other or pointing away from each other. Weight and gravitational force, both of them. When I draw my pair, they're Forces are always acting towards each other. So I got one more column here, and then we'll actually get to the application. Questions up to here? Direction of force with respect to the objects. If there's a force involved, there's two objects and then the force itself that the force is not officially an object at this level. You cannot have an object that exerts, we'd say, an external force on itself. Although there are some theorists when I was in graduate school who did speculate that electrons could exert a force on themselves, but uh, to my knowledge, it, that's never, it just still remains theory. And when I say theory, I'm talking about theorists basically, well, it's not unallowed yet, so let's just uh, let's pretend it's true and see what happens. And then when they discover it to be true, the person's hand is a genius ahead of his time. And if it turns out not to be true, it ends up in the, along with most of their, the stuff that theorists come up with. So friction is always parallel to the surfaces of contact. Tension is along the line of the taut rope, chain, string, whatever it's pulling. Other is problem specific. And another example of other, instead of just we don't care or don't know what the source is. If I Newton force is pushing on the blocks to the east, that 
That's an example of other. Normal force, what does normal mean? By the way, it's a math term. Somebody just said it. Perpendicular. Yep. Yeah. Normal force is always is perpendicular to the surfaces of contact. And the gravitational force points to the center of mass. In other words, the Earth is pulling down on me with a weight. That force acting on me is pointing towards the center of mass of the Earth. Likewise, I'm pulling up on the Earth. Because again, it comes in pairs. They're pointing towards each other. So I'm pulling up on the Earth, and that force is directed towards my center of mass. All right, questions to hear before we actually start into the dynamic, absolutely spectacular world of force diagrams, boxes, ramps, ground. Yes, I said it all. We're doing it. So the first drawing I'll draw up here is going to be the actual situation. So I have ground, and I represent the ground that these, the hash marks off to the side are indicating it's not moving. It's some, you want to treat it as earth, that's great. A floor, that's fine too. And it's part of the ground, and I have a box that is falling. I'm ignoring air resistance, but I'm going to put a little stream right here just to indicate that it is falling. So once we have the drawing of what's actually happening here, the next step is to actually draw the forces. So the next step is to actually draw the objects separate from each other. Now here they're already starting to separate, but I still want just for, for the habit I'm going to draw the box over here, and I'm going to draw the ground. This is where I'm going to draw my forces. The other thing that this does is I'm identifying what is important here. The box as a whole is important. I could potentially draw the box in terms of two pieces. I could have an upper half and a lower half, or in quadrants, or I could break it up into each atom or each particle in the atom, at some point it becomes worthless in terms of actually coming up with something worthwhile. So we now have our checklist, FTOM. Are there any of the forces of the five that I have listed there, any of them that we can immediately eliminate because they do not belong in this problem? All right. Uh, why no other? No other resistance. Okay. It's not given. That, that's what I was going for, but yes. Uh, air resistance, if we brought into it, I'd probably throw an A in there for air resistance, treat it se separate. Air resistance also can be broken up into three different types, and so it's a huge mess to get up to. So I will gladly ignore it. Uh, somebody said tension. Why are we getting rid of tension? Okay. Friction. Why not? Uh, no air resistance. Right. And why? I, There's no contact. That's what I'm going for. Air resistance can be considered friction, but I consider it sort of a separate entity. This is the friction caused by actual contact. Okay. There's one more we can get rid of. Normal. See how easy this is? We haven't even drawn a single force. We've already gotten rid of 80% of the problem. All right, we do have a gravitational force. 
What is the gravitational force called in this situation? Going forward, wait, gravitational, if you said. Yeah, that's the gravitational. If you said gravitational force, that is a correct answer, but I was going more specifically. So which way is the weight acting on the box? Uh, All right, because weight acts towards the other object. This is the force that the Earth exerts on the box. They come in pairs, and so they're building, being pulled towards each other. Later on, we can do the calculations, but if I climbed up on this table and I jumped off, I would be pulled towards the Earth, but the Earth is also being pulled towards me. Because my mass is so much less, you notice it more with me. And you can actually calculate it. The, amount, the distance I would pull the Earth towards me is about the size of a nucleus. All right, we're done. That, that's our first force diagram. Woo, one down. Rookie mistakes. <laughs> Someday I'll formalize this and that it'll actually number them. But what I'm going to call is rookie mistake number one. Drawing the forces in no man's land. I want to make it clear that what the force is acting on, but too often I would see something like this. Or I'm going, what? Now, sometimes it's a little bit hinted, so sometimes I would see something like that, and I'm going, okay, I think the intent is something like that they split it that way. Now they're backwards, but you know, there are certain situations where I, I sort of make a call that which way I think was intended, but this right here, no, it, what I refer to as no man's land. Rookie mistake number two, basically backwards. And just to emphasize, do not do these. Poison to your mind. All right, I think we're ready. Fox on ground. So first thing we, I do is draw the, the separate diagrams. I'm going to draw my box here, and I draw the ground. I am not telling you that the box is now in the air. All I've done is I've drawn a box, I've drawn the ground. You don't have to draw them in the same relative position, but I find it a lot easier if you do. Or I find it easier if I do it. We've got our checklist. Is there any force that we can immediately get rid of? Friction. Yep. Always go home when it's open. No, there's not. It's sitting there. Would that be open? That would take away? Is there friction? Not for me. All right. So this is a drawing thing. If it looks like I intended the ground to be level, the ground is level. I have not so far played the game of, it was at a one degree angle, I can't believe you missed that. I don't play that game. Uh, so if it looks like I intended it to be level, it's level. So therefore the box has no desired way to move. So therefore we can eliminate friction just because even though there's the contact, there's not the desired motion. All right, so that leaves two forces here, normal and gravitational. Uh, let's take gravitational. I find weight to be the easiest one. Which way is weight acting on what? Certain directions, like pushing down, pushing up on the box. 
pushing down and up the, on the box? The weight of the box pushing down towards the center of the cap. All right. It, it's helpful if you can put it in terms of the weight is acting, give me a direction, on the, give me the object. So the weight is acting down on the box, the weight is acting up on the box. One of those two. Right. And so if you put it in those, those terms, that's how you draw the arrow. If the weight's acting down on the box, well, I draw my arrow down on the box. And they come in pairs. So where do I draw my other arrow? Up on the From the floor? Up on the ground. Thank you. On. It might not seem like much, but I find some context from becomes vague. That makes it sound like a, a different source than what I'm thinking. But the box is not in the ground. I don't get it. The box is on the ground. All I've done is just draw the box. This is. I'm not saying the box is in the area. Oh, sorry. Are you saying weight does not require contact? Okay. Oh, sorry. Ask your question again. <laughs> No, no. The starting point is the, the box on the ground, and the whole diagram can be just drawn there, no? Oh. Is why, that why do you need to forces on your original oh, Over here? Yeah. Yeah. I require that the other one. I, I will show you in just a minute. We'll call it rookie ah. mistake number three. Ah, okay. Now, some people can do it. Uh, I've seen way too many people not be able to do it right, and so that's why I highly recommend doing it this way. All right, so weight's done. I have only one small object, so I can have only one weight. Uh, gravitational force done, and normal force. Think about you, sitting on a chair. If the chair suddenly disappeared, magically, what would you do? So which way was the chair exerting a force on you? The earth is pushing up on the box. The box is pushing down on the earth. If you are walking in dirt or mud, this is the force here that leaves footprints. <clears throat> Questions before we talk about rookie mistake number three. All right. If you're going to draw, try to draw the forces on the on the diagram like this. I've seen it written that way too many times, and that's why I strongly recommend separating the two objects when you're drawing the arrows. Just so it does, doesn't get cluttered. That, that's the big reason why. Now, if you draw very carefully, yeah, you probably could do, I've got weight acting down there, I have normal force acting up, and I, over here I've got weight acting up and normal force acting down. Yeah, but... And also forget, I'm over a half century old. This is for you youngins. I need to be able to see it. And it gets especially bad if suddenly you realize you made a mistake and you're using ink. And so now you've scratched it out. If you're running short on paper, just let me know. I'll supply you with paper. Use the space. All right, questions to hear because we just. Give you a little bit of a teaser. We're about to do box on box on ground. And that one actually has a direct application. So it will explain a mystery of life.
Now I have two boxes here, so I'm just going to cleverly label them box one and box two. So given the method that I'm trying to teach here, what's my first step? Separate. All right. Can we eliminate any of the the five forces. And friction is eliminated for the same reason as last time. So let's start out with weight, the gravitational force. Now we have two small objects here. So uh, give me one of the weight vectors in which direction? On what object? Box two is going down to the floor. Box two is doing the action there? Oh, uh, it says um, it's going down with its weight to the floor. All right. So box two is pulling? Uh, no, it's not pulling. It's just... Box two is being pulled? You, you seem unsure. Sure. Someone would you help Jesse out? No one wants to help Jesse out? What did he do to you? <laughs> the weight of box two is pulling it out. On? Itself. So, um, so if the planet disappeared, this thing is still going to fall? Self-propulsion. That would be interesting engineering there. All it requires is itself. I, I think the intent of what you said, Jesse, was absolutely right. Just I'm working on the wording. But you, you were doing box two? All right. So gravitational force is a pull. It pull something's pulling. What's pulling on box two? Okay, oh, ground. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so, which way is the ground pulling on box two? It's pulling up. No, pulling mm -hmm. Don't go over there. The ground is pulling down on box two. Oh, I, I got you. Okay, I see. And, and, and again, I, I believe you would have written it correctly. I mean, that's what I have written down. Okay. Uh, they come in pairs. Where's the other one? Sure. On which way? Up. Up. All right. Can we consider number one uh, gravity weight? I mean, that would be weight two, or not weight one. All right. So let's let's bring in the weight of which way is the weight acting on box one? And where's the other part of that pair? Oh, first on the earth. And, and then you get the, the component between the boxes. All right, let's, well, first off, let's deal with this, right, this one right here. There are a couple things floating out here, and I want to make sure we hit them all. All right, so what is pulling down on box one? The earth. The earth. The earth. So the earth is where the other part of that pair comes in. Now let's bring in something that Roberto mentioned, subscripts. This weight of box one and the weight of box two are not the same. We have to somehow differentiate them. Now, personally, when I draw, put in my subscripts, I like the subscript to have some meaning to the problem itself. And so I'm gonna go with Roberto's suggestion. This is weight one, weight one, weight two, weight two. Rookie mistake number four, ignoring subscripts when you need them. We didn't need to have subscripts before because we had only one small object and the ground. But now we have two small objects we do need to differentiate. 
if we were doing this really officially, this and this one would be the same length. And then this and this would be the same length as each other. If box two weighs more than box one, then my W2 arrow here will be longer than my W1 arrow. Right. I have only two small objects, got my two sweet, my two weights there. It's done. Normal force. Oh. Uh, something Courtney brought up about the force acting up on on box two. There is officially a gravitational force between box one and box two. We are ignoring that. Because in order to measure that gravitational force, you need multi-million dollar equipment that is well beyond the scope of, even if you're doing engineering, you don't care about that. Unless you're, I guess if you're building physics equipment, you do. But when you're building bridges, buildings, roads, whatever, people, then yeah, those forces are so incredibly tiny, we easily ignore them. All right, normal force. Normal force is acting on what object in which direction? All right, uh, except there is no friction here. Oh. What's causing this? So we got those two objects touching, so we got our normal force pair right there. Any other normal force pair? Box one, box two. Yep, which way is it acting on box one? Uh, Do I put a question mark after this? No, I understand. <laughs> and? And now box two. There you have it. Done. What about box one and the earth? Shouldn't there be a normal force pair there? That last normal force one should have a subscript of one. Yeah. Yes, it should. Thank you very much. Thanks. Um, so what about box one on the ground? Okay, I heard not touching here. There's some other thing said that I missed. I apologize. Uh, yeah, that's uh, another rookie mistake is Assuming there's normal force between ground and everything. There's not. <clears throat> All right, so let's now actually apply this to something deal. Person on scale on ground. It's the same situation. I got one object on top of another object on the ground. If I draw my force diagram here, I got my ground. I have a scale. I have a person. We've already done the force diagram, so I'm just going to, all I'm going to do is just change the subscripts. So I have weight of person here, weight of person here. I have weight of scale. Weight of scale. I have normal force acting up on person and that same normal force acting down on scale. And then I have this normal force on scale acting up on the scale and twice the S acting down on the ground. So it's exactly what we did, just change subscripts and the objects. And while you're writing that down, let me grab the problem.
the scale. This was part of my inheritance. So, the question is, when I stand on the scale, what is the scale measuring? Nope. Uh, technically, balances measure mass, scales measure forces. And you tell the difference on a balance, I dig into the moon, I get the same result. Uh, the scale, I get a different result. Nope. So not directly. We, we infer weight from it, but it's not actually measuring weight. The force of your weight? Nope. Think about the diagram. What force does the person exert on the scale? That's the force that the person exerts on the scale. That is what the scale actually measures. Yeah, it's the normal force. It measures normal force. That's why when I step on this analog scale, Hey, I weigh about 300 pounds. Oh, no, I weigh 50 pounds. Oh, 350. Oh, my weight's not changing just because I'm bouncing on the scale. All that's changing is the amount of normal force I'm pushing on it. So why do we claim that it measures weight? The assumption is that you're not going to be bouncing on the scale. So what is the assumption? What's the magic word? Not acceleration. That's what somebody said. Velocity. What's that? Velocity is what you mean. Uh, except when I'm bouncing, then my velocity is zero at the peaks. It's the not velocity. velocity. Is constant. The velocity is constant. What is that condition known as? Velocity. Oh, I was thinking of the equilibrium. <laughs> if I am in equilibrium, and that is the assumption we make, if I'm in equilibrium, then the total force equals zero, which means the total force up minus the force down equals zero. If that is the case, then the normal force that I am exerting on the scale, which is the same as equal magnitude of the normal force the scale exerts on me, is equal to my weight. So if I'm not bouncing, if my acceleration is zero, if I'm in equilibrium, then normal force and weight should have equal magnitudes. That's why we claim it. But really, it is directly measuring normal force. We are inferring weight. I will try not to do real life examples too often because it's physics. We do keep in the realm of magical thought. But occasionally, you know, reality slips in. That's probably a line best delivered if you can actually see my facial expressions. But I will. The other day, I, I think I gave across the wrong impression. I saw this, this guy standing out in the street carrying something, and I was looking at him, trying to figure out what he was holding in his hand. And so I had the, that look, I mean, I had a mask on, so I kind of looked like this, which sometimes comes across as an angry look. Because <laughs> it looked like he was carrying a log. I was trying to think, why is he carrying a log? It turns out he was holding his child. I, I had sort of the envy when all I could see was the, what turned out to be the hair. <laughs> <laughs> but I think it came across like I was looking at him like, what is a stranger doing in my neighborhood? Oh well. <laughs> the price when uh, my quizzical look and my angry look look too much alike. And on that note, have a wonderful day, evening, wonderful tomorrow.